Hi, I am Hannah Beekler, production designer, and you're listening to The Go Creator Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I am a director and owner of BC Media Productions, and this is The Go Creative Show, the show dedicated to creative professionals in the video production, filmmaking, television, and music industries. Hannah Beekler is the production designer behind some of today's hottest films, including Creed, Moonlight, and the upcoming Black Panther, and she's on the show to discuss her career in film and the role of a production designer. The Go Creative Show is supported by our friends at Kessler, making innovative tools for filmmakers. Visit them at KesslerCrane.com. Rule Boston Camera, buy, rent, create at Rule.com. Newsshooter.com, essential news for real-world shooters. Shutterstock.com, hedge for Mac, the fastest way to backup media. And PremiumBeat.com, premium, royalty-free music and sound. Well, I am very excited. We here at BC Media Productions are very excited because... Uh, after a long, long edit process, we have so much material that we're going to be releasing um, over the next couple of weeks. All the stuff we shot over the summer and the early fall, um, great work for Indeed, Iron Mountain, uh, just a whole bunch of stuff that we did this summer that I've been so excited to share is uh, coming up. So continue to check our uh, website, bcmediaproductions.com. Of course, you can also check my Twitter at Ben Consoli, B-E-N-C-O-N-S-O-L-I, and I'll let you guys know when all that stuff is released. And I'd really love to get your opinions because we talk so much about other people's work. It'd be exciting to um, share some of ours and let you uh, have at it. Let us know what you think. Uh, but today we're all about production design. We haven't had a production designer on the show and so happy that we do now. Hannah Beekler has worked on so many amazing films. Um, Miles Ahead, the Miles Davis film, which is a, basically a period piece that spans like three or four decades. Of course, Creed, everybody knows that film. And the new film Moonlight, which everyone's talking about now. It's beautiful. Um, and the upcoming Black Panther, uh, the big blockbuster on its way. We talked to her about all those things and uh, what exactly does a production designer do? Because you may not know how early in a production they are involved. They are one of the very first people involved. And it's really cool to get her perspective on a film. Um, and that's coming up in just a few minutes. But before we get there, I want to talk about Rule Boston Camera. Rule is the place to go to purchase and rent all of your production equipment. We all know that. But what you may not know is that they have these events called Learning Labs. These are free events that are really great. They're packed with so much information and they're free and they're at their facility there in Boston. Now, if you can't make it to Boston, don't worry because they post all of their events on their Vimeo page, which you can also get to at rule.com. Here's just an example of some of the recent uh, learning labs. Run and gun with the Sony PXW Z150. A lighting tools from Aladdin. I love Aladdin lights. An introduction to 360 video and uh, mixing audio for picture with our very own Matt Russell from the Go Creative Show. So, and this is just in the past couple of months. So these guys have been cranking out these labs for years. And, um, you know, we're so glad to be the recipients of that work. And you can get it for free at rule.com, R-U-L-E.com. So go there, buy some stuff, rent some stuff, and learn. And lastly, Hedge for Mac. Hedge is the fastest application for importing and backing up media in OS X. It has a simple interface, but it's very powerful. And it's built with video, photo, and audio in mind. You can import multiple sources and send them to multiple destinations at the same time. Uh, and it's optimized for files 100 megabytes or larger. But the most important thing is that it's faster than the Finder. And it's cross-verified. So not only are you getting speed, but you're also getting the reassurance that your files are copied correctly. That is super important. And that's why I love, that's why I love Hedge for Mac. Now, uh, they have a free version at hedgeformac.com, but I strongly encourage you to get the paid version. Uh, it's not that expensive at only $100. It's worth every penny. But if you want to even save more, uh, go to hedgeformac.com forward slash go creative. Uh, go, I'm sorry, hedgeformac.com forward slash go creative show, and you will get a 20% off discount. So that is certainly a reason to head over there. Hedgeformac.com, H E D G E F O R M A C.com forward slash go creative show to take advantage of that great 20% off uh, deal. All right, it's time for our spotlight. Hannah Beekler. Hannah Beekler is a prolific production designer with an affinity for realistic design that emphasizes emotional drama. 
Over the past few years, Hannah's designed some of the hottest films like Miles Ahead, Creed, Moonlight, Beyonce's Lemonade, and the much-anticipated upcoming film Black Panther. Hannah and I discuss the role of a production designer, how she collaborates with the camera department, working with director Ryan Coogler, and how she finds inspiration for each of her films. So I am here with production designer Hannah Beekler. Hannah, thank you so much for being on Go Creative Show. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Your work is absolutely beautiful. And it's one of those things where I think production design, first of all, is not something that has been represented very well on this show because we have a lot of cinematographers, but we don't necessarily talk about all of the stuff that's on the screen. We talk about how how it's shot, but we don't necess- necessarily talk about what it is that's being shot. And uh, that's really what you're responsible for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, in conjunction with the director and the cinematographer, I'm responsible for the look, the tone, the mood, the sort of canvas of the story. Well, what sorts of what's for the people that have no idea what pre- production design is? How do you describe it? What is it that you do? You know, an easy, a really easy way to describe it is like an architect. So I, you know, design the sets and, um, you know, I don't personally build the sets, but we have a huge uh, construction and paints team that then goes in and builds the sets. We have set designers who are like draftsmen. And they do all the plans and all the site plans and elevations. We do um, VR of sets so we can see the size. So we're doing virtual reality sets for aircrafts and things like that. Um, We have art directors who are then in charge of certain sets. So it's a big department. And are you also responsible for any of like the prop choices and the decoration at all? Yes, yes. Set deck is part of my team, as well as the prop uh, property team is part of my team. So, um, you know, it's sort of like production design and then uh, art direction, construction and paint, uh, set decoration, props, and sort of, you know, um, also uh, costume design and hair and makeup and all of that. So it, it all has to work together. And you've worked on so many really great films, Miles Ahead, Creed, Beyonce's Lemonade, um, TV special, the upcoming Moonlight, Black Panther coming up. I mean, it's just one thing after another. You, you, you are skyrocketing right now. It's, it's amazing. It must, uh, it must feel so great. It does. It's, it's, it's weird. I, uh, you know, I often, you kind of just, your work is your life. And so I'm just sort of plugging away every day doing by saying and every once in a while, I'll, I'll be like, wow, you know, I've been blessed this last three years of just having magnificent stories um, and films that I've been able to work on with so many great people. And really, it all started with Fruitvale Station and Ryan Coogler. Yeah. You know, he's he really changed um, the trajectory of my career, he changed me as a person and, and me at, as a production designer and, and how I approach my craft. So he was, a, he's been a big part of my career. How did that relationship start? How'd you meet him? I, I just, I had just signed with my agency, Datner Dispoto, and um, the first script that they gave me was for Vail Station. And my agent was like, she's like, it's a really small film. It's in San Francisco, but you have to read the script. And I read the script and I, I, you know, called her immediately. And I said, I want to, I want to take this meeting. I want to meet this, this guy. So I Skyped Ryan, we Skyped, we interviewed and we just clicked pretty, pretty instantly. And, and I told him in that interview, I was like, I really want to work on this project. And about an hour later, he called me back on Skype and he was like, you know, I want to, I want to work with you. And I was like, all right, let's do this. So that's how that started. And we've just had a great working relationship ever since. And since, since that first film with uh, Ryan Fruitvale, uh, um, how, how am I pronouncing that? Fruitvale Station? Yes. Fruitvale Station, you went on to Creed, um, the upcoming yeah. Black Panther. I, I mean, it re- yeah. <laughs> that's certainly a great uh, Skype call. <laughs> that, yeah. that turned into an amazing <laughs> career. It is. It is. And, you know, it's, it's really a testament to Ryan and, 
and uh, his hustle and his hard work and dedication to wanting to bring really great stories to life in a different way, in a really uh, relevant and uh, socially conscious way. And I, you know, before I met Ryan, I always said to myself, like, you know, I looked at a lot of these really great production designers' careers, and a lot of them do work with two or three different directors, and they've kind of found their people. And I always wanted that. I always wanted to find that director who we were really simpatico as far as aesthetics and approach, story approach, and stuff. And and, and Ryan is that person for me. And, you know, we're really family at this point. So how do you approach a brand new project? Like, I'm assuming that you must get in so early before really, before really anybody. Uh, when do you get involved in kind of what is your role in the early stages? You know, I get involved probably one of the first people on after the director And, you know, a lot of it is about finding, depending on the film, finding locations, starting to um, do a lot of conceptual development of uh, the story and of the sets and start really, like, figuring out what our different um, themes are and how we pull those themes through the film. So I'm there really, really, really early. And, uh, and, and that's usually how we get going is just breaking the story down and breaking down the characters and the time period. If there is one miles was a few time periods and, and, um, and, and really working with directors who have a a vision for what it is they want. Like Don was like that Barry on Moonlight, they, you know, Ryan, of course, and, um, really, uh, know what they want you know, as far as, as vision. And, and I just come in and sort of bring my, bring myself to the project. And, and, uh, that's, that's usually how it works, but I am there very, very early. <laughs> Let's talk about miles ahead. Uh, because this film spans a couple of decades, fifties through the seventies, right? Yeah. So I'm guessing there's, you know, you're you're basically doing production design for three different periods across one film, needing to, you know, keep somewhat consistency between them. What was your approach to that film? You know, the first thing I did was I just collected thousands of pictures of New York City during that time period, during all the time periods, and thousands of pictures of Miles throughout the, you know, decades and listening to his interviews and you know, he did a lot of his interviews in his own home and um, when he did them, which wasn't often, and seeing what his surroundings were like and how he sort of like presented himself. And uh, Don always said, you know, this he wanted it to be a movie that Miles would be, you know, proud to be the star of. So it was sort of fiction and it was fact and we really wanted it to be like Miles music, which was sort of like this stream of consciousness. So it it was, you know, digging into the time periods and always keeping the thought of who Miles was because he was a huge personality. And he, uh, he was kind of a crazy guy too, outside of his music, just his own personal life. So it was, it was a lot about that and color control, um, you know, stringing the blue colors throughout and then having some colors fade out uh, when he's in the 70s and, and he's not playing music anymore. It was a lot of fun just like really digging in and and it was really stylized. And, and Don is just like brilliant and funny and awesome to be around. So that was, it made it really easy. And the Don we're talking about is Don Gito, director and star of yes. the film. Um I want to take a moment and elaborate just a bit more on that blue color that you were talking about. Um, It sounds like you're pushing some themes and some concepts through colors, through set design. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, yeah. There was, you know, in the 50s when he was first married to Frances and it was this very fairy tale love story that happened and and everything was very light. It was, you know... uh, very light pale blues, pale yellows, uh, lots of flowers and 
and plants and life. And if you really look at the set, everything has this pastel um, sort of grazed across all of the sets. And as time goes on and their marriage starts to break down, we start to change the colors to harder colors. The flowers go away. There's little life in the house. It turns all green. So we were starting to get into really cool colors and as their marriage cools down um and you know the furniture is slowly changing to complement and sort of tell us what our time period is and you know there's some constants obviously because you'll see a lot of his music sort of represented in the spaces that we're in and by the time we get to the 70s and francis is no longer in his life, we go to browns and tans and beiges and really pull the neutrals out. We bring in the furs and sort of the more uh, bolder, uh, later 70s, early 80s miles. Um, So, you know, the red trumpet comes out, the black trumpet comes out at that point in time. And so that's sort of how we strung through those time periods and, and and sort of fading into uh, the 70s, which got a little dark for him. Obviously, Miles Ahead is based on Miles Davis, so it's a true story. Uh, How much do you get into looking at photography of his actual home and, you know, maybe some of his own artifacts and and really really try to work off those versus trying to push storylines through moods and colors and things like that? Do you have to balance that? You really have to balance that. And I did look at a lot of pictures of his homes and tried to find what was consistent with the things that were always in his homes at the different time periods. So, you know, he had one major piece that we made sure to have, which was his um, sort of built in half circle wood couch that he was photographed with a lot. So we put that in and he, in one of his homes, sort of one of the things that he made sure of, and this was in the uh, late fifties, was that there were no sharp corners. So everything was a curve in that house. There were no, everything was either a circle, there were no corners, uh, everything was curved. So we kind of picked up a little bit of that as well. Um, that was like a big thing for him in that time period. And so, you know, we did, we did do a lot with, with that. His nephew and his son came to the set, which was the big set, which was his house, which we converted to an old church. And, you know, I was standing outside and they walked inside and I was kind of like, okay, let's see what they say. And they came out and his nephew was, you know, had a tear in his eye and he's like, you know, man, you really captured my uncle. He's like, that's his, that's his home. He's like, that's what I remember. Like the essence of everything is what I remember. And that, that was sort of, that was like the best compliment I, and anyone could ever get. Cause you know, while we brought what we needed for our story, we were still able to capture what was actually a a feeling or essence or what it was for his family. So that's always important. The same was true with the Fruitvale station that we got that right. So um, it's, it's a fine line, but you find ways to, uh, to do it. Did you shoot miles ahead in Cincinnati? Yes, we did. What brought you there over, you know, New York, LA, what brought you there? You know, right now, New York, they did look at New York and it isn't what, you know, French Connection, that New York is gone. That 70s New York is mostly gone. It's harder to find. I think there was some expense um, to it as well in the decision making about budget, budgetary needs. And Cincinnati really offered um, a lot of feeling of the time period that we needed because they haven't, you know, sort of knocked down all of their uh, historical buildings and big pieces of the downtown area that felt like New York uh, gone by. So that was, and their tax incentive, of course. So that, that, those were the things that attracted the production to Cincinnati. Now, are you based out of New Orleans? Did I read that correctly online? Yes. So I'm curious what, I know, industry is booming in that area but did you go out there 
for the industry or did you just happen to land there and then fall into the, in- well, not fall in, but land and, but sort of get enveloped in the industry that was already there? I actually, 12 years ago, my brother and his wife and uh, family lived in New Orleans for many years. And he called me one day and he was like, you know, they're making movies down here. You should definitely come down here. There's all these movies about 12 years ago. Where were you before? I was in Ohio. I was in um, Cincinnati, Ohio. Oh, okay. And um, I was like, uh, I don't know, New Orleans? That sounds weird. He said, come down. You know, you can stay with us. And, and I went down. I was like, okay, so let me go down and see what this is about. And um, I kind of started working right away on a really tiny little film. Um and I think it was as a set dresser. I met a lot of great people, a lot of friends I still have. But about seven months later, um, Katrina happened. Mm. So I ended up with my brother and his family. We kind of ended up picking up the night before the storm hit and going back north. And that was kind of devastating. I mean, it was really devastating. They They never moved back. And I went back like a month later because a film that I had... Uh, tried to get on, called me, and they were going in North Louisiana to to film like a month after Katrina. So I was went right back down and uh, it, to Shreveport and started working. So I worked a lot there, and um, I owe a big chunk of my resume to uh, Louisiana. Mm-hmm. I met a lot of people in the industry um, who ended up have you know supporting me throughout my career. So. Um, it was a big, it was a good move. <laughs> it was a good move. Does the industry feel different in places like, um, you know, Cincinnati, New Orleans versus what most people consider the hub of, you know, production in the country, Los Angeles, and New York? I mean, it is. And, and when I work in LA, I know what, you know, it comes down to crew and how long the industry has been someplace, you know, it takes a while for people to sort of, you know, find where, where they belong and, you know, in the industry and, and what they want to do. Um, and, you know, once a, a city gets saturated with, with the industry like New Orleans did, um, it does become in essence, like sort of LA. It's just the business, um, the meetings, the uh, uh, green lighting, and all of those things are in Los Angeles, and those those things won't. I don't believe will leave Los Angeles. Um, you know, the production itself is is in these tax incentive cities and states, and that's a there's a big difference there. I you know, it's <laughs> they they all sort of have their own way. When you get to the East Coast in Philly and New York, that's a different type of um, rules and whatnot as far as the union is concerned, but uh, uh, and what people do. So I'm, I'm always learning. I'm always, you know, showing up in these states and <clears throat> learning what how how they go about production. But as far as you know, research and development and all of those things, that's in Los Angeles, and so you are kind of there for different reasons. I don't. Yeah, you know, the, a lot of television is still in Los Angeles, but not a lot of film. Mm. I want to talk about Creed and shooting in Philadelphia. And I, I find it interesting that working on the Miles Davis film, you're sort of constrained by the man, the person. You know, he had a style. He had a references, visual references that you could jump off of. And in Creed, you're also bound by something else. It's it's a sequel to a very, very important and um, popular string of movies. Uh, how does it feel to jump into a project that has sort of already been established, although now you're making the next the next chapter of it? I mean, it, it, it's pretty wild. When, when Ryan approached me with this, he called me. He was in London scouting, um, just doing some initial scouting with the film. And he called me and he said, hey, I want to get you on this film. Can you get to L.A. for a meeting? And I was like, yes, of course. You know, I got the script and started, like, reading it. And it really hit me at one point. Like, this is Rocky. Like, this is crazy. I remember it when I was a kid. You know, I watched Rocky 
when I was a kid and we would run around the house and sing the song and do the thing. So it was, <laughs> so it was pretty wild for me. It's like, you know, this is like American uh, iconography, you know? So I really had to, the first thing I did was like, I, I got to immerse myself into the world of boxing and the world of Rocky. So I watched all the movies again yeah. and I, I kind of, I'm really familiar with the franchise. So I just kind of, freshened myself up on the first four, which is really where our story picks up after the fourth one in a way, and after Apollo dies. And so it was, it was, I thought, what is Ryan getting me into? (laughs) 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 Um, But it was, it is very different in the sense that, you know, you want to make this film that stands on its own, but you also want to, uh, pay homage and respect to this original franchise and you know you have the man himself in the film so it 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 was awesome and it was really like you know I wanted to make sure I was on point for that film because I did not want to disappoint the Rocky fans which there are millions of yeah (laughs) and and I didn't want to disappoint you know the the Winklers who really brought this franchise to life and or Ryan or myself so but I think we managed to do a good job of doing both things of keeping it its own thing it stands alone and then also stringing through um, the Rocky franchise which was fun because I put Easter eggs all over the place. <laughs> like what? Like what? Could you name a few? <laughs> um, well, the one big gem that was supposed to be like um, the gym in LA, that the red, the really red and black one, there, you'll see a lot of the pictures. But as you go, we put stuff from older Rockies all over the place. So we actually got to get some stuff out of storage. Um, his belt is in it in his house. I don't know if you see it, but it's um, downstairs in his house. Those turtles um, that we put in there. Now we tried to get actual cuff and link, but they were too big for what we, they couldn't fit in the smaller. Um, they're still alive. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. All, cuff and link are still alive, but they're big, they're huge now. Um, so we threw that reference in there. There was pictures um, from the first Rocky of um, which they didn't really show too much of in that Rocky, but their wedding, there was wedding pictures everywhere. And then pictures from the set that uh, uh, it's Natalia Shire, I think, played uh, Adrian and, and Sly Stallone when they were just, they look like babies, would just be goofing around in between sets. So we had a bunch of that stuff all over the place. Oh, cool. And, uh, stuff from Polly. We had his hat in one of the scenes, his famous hat that he always wore. Uh, in his uh, room. And so there's little things all over the place. (laughs) But it was like, oh man, we need to get this or we need to get that. So that was a lot of fun. That's got to be a lot of fun to just put those things in and you just sort of hope that some, you know, hope that some people notice it. (laughs) Did did you get any feedback afterwards from fans just picking up on those things? They did. There was one um, YouTube show that the whole thing was like five minutes or something. They just went through and like circled all of the stuff. And I just thought that was the coolest. (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. Like, ah, they did that. That's awesome. And uh, so they pulled out as many Easter eggs, like when, uh, you're not in there really like for a long time. I think we go into Apollo's trophy room. We did do a trophy room. That was tons of fun. Like we had like the people magazine cover that they did. Um, it was awesome. So just stuff like that all over the place. And, and it was really an honor to have uh, the, had that opportunity. And, and it was tons of fun just getting into the world of boxing and hanging out with the uh, guys, Tony Ballou, um, uh, Gabe, you know, Andre Ward, who was another one. They're just really magnificent guys. So it was, it was a lot of fun to see what that was like. Was boxing a world that you had any familiarity with at all? Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> not at all. I never really even watched, you know, I certainly know about it now, but I'd never even watched a boxing match before. Um, you know, I knew some famous boxers, I knew names and, and, and who was who a little bit, but I didn't get into sort of like what that world and, and sort of culture was like. And it is, it's its own thing. So it's pretty cool. So in a case like that, I mean, like, how do you prepare to create these visuals. I mean, you really are the one responsible for making sure that it looks right 
and it's something that you know nothing about. <laughs> so oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that. It's really immersing yourself in the world. It's really like we went to a boxing match in New York, and that was something like that whole thing it was really late at night. Um, we, you know, I, the guys that came in, of course, Tony is, um, who played the, um, kind of bad guy boxer from England, pretty Ricky, you know, talking to him a lot, talking to the fight choreographer a lot, doing, you know, getting in there and, and punching some bags myself. And then when we were looking at locations, we were really in a lot of real gyms in Philly. So we, you know, when I was there, I would talk to the owners, I would talk to the boxers, the different weight boxers, the different level, re different regional um, boxers, read everything you can about it, call uh, the WBA and, and talk to them, get their rules. So we, like every time we set up a boxing match, it was to the rules of um, wh whichever organization we were saying it was at the time. The last one was WBA rules. Um, so that's how everything was set up in that fight. Um, to regulation. So we really wanted to make sure that we were on point with that down to like what thickness Matt was on the, um, in the ring at the time, um, according to what the fight was. And so you just really, that's all your life is about for the time that you're on the film. You must go into a room and just look at everything. F family must hate having you over. <laughs> you, you go into, cause they know you're going into their house and you're absorbing everything. Yeah. Yeah, they do. They do. <laughs> you know what? I was taught that at a really young age. My dad was an architect and my mom was an interior designer. So, Oh God. I, so you're, I, so it's in the blood. It is. And I grew up with it big time. My dad designed and built the house I grew up in and my mom would redecorate it every season. So it was me being around at his office, carpet samples and paint samples and different materials and going on site with him to, I remember you fly to Cleveland in a little tiny, you know, prop plane and go to his different um, work sites. And I helped him build the guest house that was outside of our, outside of our house. So yeah, it was, it's, it, you know, <laughs> it's been there for a really long time. Did you always think you were going to get into film or did you think you'd get into, you know, archite architecture or interior design outside of production? You know, originally I wanted to be a fashion designer. Oh. So that's, that's what I, what I went to kind of on a, in a different way, using all of the things that I grew up with and, and got into fashion at a really young age, went to college for it. And then right at the end of my time as a you know fashion major, I decided I wanted to get into photography and literature. You know, I changed everything right at the last second. And then I started getting into film. A lot of my friends were in bands, so I would make these music videos yeah. back in the 90s, <laughs> you know, for them. And, uh, and then I was like, okay, I, need, I want to go to film school. I really want to be serious about this. And then I fell into the art department and never looked back. Hmm. That, that's interesting. Uh, so you sort of, I, I like that. I like that kind of career change idea. I think a lot of people may be intimidated by doing that. They sort of stay on one track and figure, well, I've dedicated so much time to this. I'm just going to stick with it. Even though there might be a craving to do something else. I think that's great. Yeah, it's, it's a big choice, but I, you know, at the end of the day, it's about like being, for me, being happy. And, you know, it's like, I don't have to go to work. I get to go to work. So I, it, it's always been like, if I wasn't feeling it, I'll just, I have to move on. That's the type of person I am. So, <laughs> so it's, it, and it made more sense. I settled into this a lot easier than I think I would have if I stayed in the fashion world. And I, and I'm glad I, I, I had the gumption to make the move. You are listening to the premiumbeat.com song of the week. It's called LA Waves by Tone Massive. Premiumbeat.com is the place to go for all of your royalty-free music and sound effects. They have a great website where you can access their collection of thousands of royalty-free tracks for as low as $49 each. 
And when you buy a song from Premium Beat, it's not just the song. You've got these really great cutdowns. 15 second, 10 second, 30 second, a minute. And they also provide loops so you can take the tracks and customize them to fit your project perfectly. But the most important thing, aside from price, aside from flexibility, is that the music is fantastic. The quality is great. They've got great artists there. And you'll love it. And your clients will love it. Premiumbeat.com. Check it out. You'll love those guys. Premiumbeat.com. All right, let's take a minute and talk about Kessler. The Kessler Shutter Dolly is the latest innovation in camera dollies and finally provides filmmakers with the performance and versatility dollies in its class have always lacked. Until now, the Shutter Dolly utilizes standard speed rails and can be operated manually or in conjunction with Kessler's motion control solutions, Cine Drive and Second Shooter Plus. For more information, visit KesslerCrane.com. You can get, um, it's actually a really good video of watching that shutter dolly work, and it looks so cool. I'm very excited to give it a shot. KesslerCrane.com, check it out now. It looks really, really cool. And lastly, Shutterstock. Shutterstock.com has nearly 3 million royalty-free video clips. Many of them are in 4K. I think a great pricing. It's very easy to search for what you're looking for. And um, you know, one of my favorite things is that they have these really great collections called Director's Choice Collections that are these masterfully curated um, collections of videos from all different topics. Now, now I talk about this every week, but today I'm going to focus on their blog because we don't really talk about it, but it is so good. You go to Shutterstock.com, click on blog, and there's such great information here uh, in all different categories. We have tips and tutorials, design, footage, contributor information, marketing news. This is a great place to go to just learn about what's happening in the industry, not just in the you know, stock footage industry, but in the production industry. Great stuff here. Tips and tutorials is a place I like to go because they teach you all sorts of like little interesting things, trends in um, you know, the different styles that videos are having nowadays, uh, different font palettes, color palettes. It's just a good place to go for inspiration. And uh, that's, of course, free because it's just a blog. So you got to head over there um, and check it out. Shutterstock.com, of course, get their footage and music and images. But check out their blog, too. Don't forget it. It's very, very cool. Shutterstock.com. All right, it's time to uh, move on to the remaining half of our interview with the great Hannah Beekler. I'm curious about the way that production design influences the cinematography like do you do, do you and the cinematographer and the in the camera department generally stay out of each other's way or is there a lot of collaboration and compromise a lot of collab a lot of collaboration sometimes compromise uh, depending on what we're looking at but yeah the cinematographer and i have to work as a unit um to really you know uh make this work, make these sets work. And we work together, you know, a lot about lighting, how we uh, integrate it into the set itself and lights that we're going to bring in and make sure that that works with the look that they're going for, the director and the cinematographer. So we all three really work together. And I might, you know, when we're doing illustrations and stuff, uh, you know, have the illustration lit a certain way that they're like, oh, wow, I didn't really think about that. Let's see what we can do with this type of thing. So... You know, yeah, it is It is definitely a collaboration. So you need to have uh, a pretty good background in the way things are shot and, you know, yes. the way, the way, what lenses are going, what the yes. lenses are going to see, how to light. You have to yep. have a, a experience in all of that. Yeah, I mean, I need to know, like, the, some of the first questions I ask the cinematographer when they come on, because they come on much later than me, it's like, you know, what are we looking at for aspect ratio? What lenses do you think you're going to, shoot on, are we going wide? Are we going, you know, tight? What are, what are we doing? <clears throat> as far as, you know, oftentimes romantic comedies will be shot in long lenses, 50 millimeter plus. And then you have sort of like horror movies and more dramatic movies that want to be shot anamorphic in a wide lens. So, you know, it's, uh, I have to know about production. I have to know what lights they're putting on them and what lights they need. A lot is LED these days. So, you know, <clears throat> you can do a lot more with LED so we can inter integrate that into our sets now because you can get the LED strips and they're really cool yeah. and uh, you know a lot uh, nowadays you know our department tech deck they're they're 
they're also lighting the sets anymore. You know, a lot of times cinematographers want to use practical lighting. So we're responsible for making sure that, that we're <clears throat> working with them together. What is your favorite part of any project? Is there, is there a point along the process that, is, that you just look forward to? Yeah, walking onto the set. Yeah. Walking onto the set as it's getting built. That's awesome. That's one of my favorite things and really like nailing a design, like really feeling good about a design, um, knowing that it's doing all the jobs that it needs to be doing for the actors, for the director, for the DP, um, for the story and um, making really bold choices and, and sticking by them um, and always challenging myself um, and challenging the people that I work with to think outside the box or push themselves in a direction they haven't really done before. So those are all the awesome parts of it. And, and that's really, really what I love about it because it, it's, it's stepping up to the challenge. Now, what's the not awesome part? <laughs> There's got to be something that you're like, ugh, you sort of dread it every time, but you know you got to do it. Yeah, me, the thousand, thousands of meetings, <laughs> yeah. um, budgets, that's no fun. Oh, my God. Uh, I can imagine. <laughs> the budget thing has got to be the worst because... I mean, it's the worst for me, and I'm I'm directing commercials and nowhere near the budgets that the films are doing, but it's always such a bummer when you're like, okay, we have these ideas, they're amazing, everyone's excited, and then you're like, yeah, but no, it's not going to work out. <laughs> it, it, it's awful. Yeah, it is. It's a big, you know, it's, sometimes it's a big bummer, and, and a lot of the times you have to, you know, maybe kill your babies or, you know, you have to... Uh, or step up to the challenge to figure out how to make it happen with what you have, um, which oftentimes spurs something a little more creative than what you expected, or you go someplace that you wouldn't have thought because, you know, you were not capable of throwing money at it. But um, so it sometimes works out, but it is just like, you know, I always say, if I'm, if you give it to me, I'm going to spend it. <laughs> 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 so let's talk about budget a little bit because your your movies have certainly been big movies, but they they have to pale in comparison to the upcoming Black Panther. I mean, this is a giant Marvel blockbuster. How does the workflow change in a project like Black Panther? It it is a monster. <laughs> it's big, um, and it it becomes more. You know, you think you do these big films and you think like, I'm going to have all this. Well, it's really the same as even the smaller films. It's just you're dealing with a lot more. Um, so every second that you have, you need. Um, you still have the same challenges on on any film when it comes to budget and, and, and really, you know, uh, the experience itself becomes bigger. But the workflow and and... and and how we, you know, go about uh, getting everything together is pretty much the same, just on a gigantic level. And um, so it's been, it's been an experience and a half, but uh, it's been a great one. Uh, so far, everybody's fantastic. Marvel's fantastic. Um, so it, it, is, it is a little, it can be an intimidating thing, but you just have to move forward at all times. Were you nervous? When, I was. Yeah. Uh, yeah and, and I know you're still very much working on it right now. Has anything even been shot yet? The internet is has been just like waiting. They're, they're so hungry for information about this film. And I know I you know. probably can't say much, but is there anything you can say to, to the fans out there? I, you know, I can say, I can't say much as you know, but I can say it's going to be uh, amazing. I, it's not going to be what people think. I said that about Creed. It's like, it's not going to be what people think. It's yeah. Ryan, it's, it's Ryan Coogler and he's going to bring him to it, which makes it special already. So, you know, it's going to be a ride. It's going to be awesome. I mean, it's just going to be badass. And that's what I can say. <laughs> In our last few minutes, I just want to briefly talk about Lemonade and Moonlight. I mean, Moonlight, we'll start there. Uh, critics are going absolutely insane over this one. Uh, how did you get involved in the film? And I guess more importantly, more I'm more curious. The world hasn't really seen it yet. 
like the large, vast majority of the world yet, but it's getting all this critical praise. When did you know that this was going to be something special? When I read the script, Mm. when I read the script, when, uh, you know, it was another one of those, I just, uh, I think I got done doing a couple commercials. I did a, a Nike commercial and, uh, my agent was like, you know, there's this little film in Miami. She's always saying this. There's this little film in Miami. And, um, you know, I just, Creed was, you know, a few months before they were getting ready to, to, to get, uh, to open. And, and I read the script for Moonlight and I just fell in love with it. And I was like, okay, it's small, but I'm, you know, this story is one of those stories that needs attention and needs to be told. Yeah. So I, I met with Barry, who's absolutely fantastic, wonderful guy, brilliant, uh, visionary. And uh, we just uh, clicked again. And uh, we had a couple mutual friends, um, you know, Ryan and Aggie Rogers. We, you know, were both friends with them. Um, and I was like, okay, let's do this. <laughs> so I drove down to Miami and got going, you know, it was like, you had to roll up my sleeves again a little bit and get in there. And we did a lot of work, but it was a labor of love all the way through. And I knew from the start, having met Barry and reading the script, that this was really going to be something completely special that no people haven't really seen in a long time. And that's, and that's Barry Jenkins, the director and writer that, uh, that you're talking about. I haven't seen the film. I very much want to, but I've seen a bunch of still frames. I've seen the trailer. It has a really unique look to it. And I'm curious, from your standpoint, where did the visual inspiration come from? You know, we wanted, we went back and forth a lot about should this be stylized? And I really like David LaChapelle, a photographer in LA. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, he just has these, like... <sighs> It's a sense of like uh, the, of something that is like very normal or homogenized that he t- just twists into this very stylized thing. Mm. Um, I got to go to a studio once and sort of meet him and walk around and talk to him a little bit. He's a wild guy. And, you know, so that was one of the influences for me. And then Barry sort of had some of his own influences that we kind of got together and looked at all this different photography. And if you'll have to excuse me, I'm not remembering a couple of the photographers names at this moment, Sure, sure. but um, we wanted to go in this way where we mix this like realism and then really feathered in a stylistic vision for it. It was sort of trying to mix these two styles in a way and hope that it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. And just looking at the stills and even just the um the poster for it, the color palette is just so cool. It, it's like that it's like a teal green. There's purples in there. There's blues in there. It's very cool, but it's very bold. Um yeah. and I love it. I mean yeah. is that a palette that you kept through wardrobe, set design, all of that. We sure did. And a lot of that came from when I started putting together, you know, all my references and sort of do my thing with uh, photographs that I love to do. Because once you put up like a thousand photos, the color story is going to start presenting itself. Mm. So, you know, I had all these photographs of Miami, um, South Beach, Miami Beach, uh, Miami proper, just from different time periods, from different sources and put them all up. And, you know, you have your sort of neon Miami and it's that pinkish purple and that, that electric blue. And then you've got the architecture that comes in the Cuban architecture, the sort of Cuban feel of being very Caribbean colors of the pastels. There aren't really pastels, but they go into that teal and that yellow, yeah. that sort of hard yellow that you see throughout this fill out throughout moonlight in uh, that teal that you see throughout moonlight. So we pulled that into the wardrobe Um so we had different variations through the time because once again, this is a period piece and it's hard to believe it. Cause I remember thinking like, this is 1992 where we start off. And if you think about it, that was almost 25 years ago. I know that <laughs> doesn't sound like a period to me. That just sounds like just now. <laughs> I don't want to think that the nineties is a period. Stop it. 
I know. That's, that's how I, it, it hit me the same way. I was like, oh man, it is a period. So <laughs> yeah, we had to harken back to that a little bit as far as like the way the TVs were and what kind of, you know, cell phones, which weren't really a thing. They were pagers. Yeah. Um, so it was stuff like that. Like what did labels on bottles like Yahoo and stuff look like? then it was weird to think that 92 is vintage now but it is so there's that and um but that was one of the things that one of the ways we sort of got that color um mixture of bringing the the sort of traditional architecture of miami and color of colors of miami and mix it really with that harsh neon lighting from that and 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 going doing bold things with it and doing walls with it and putting pink in juan's house and um you know, having that there and not really having to explain why. So it was, you know, it was really, it was, it was really a huge collaboration with, with James Laxon, the cinematographer and me and Barry to uh, get this color story and, and mix the sort of grit, which I hope people uh, realize is still there, but bring this very slick uh, color look. Well, the film looks amazing. I cannot wait to see it. Um, and just the last topic I want to hit before we, before we let you go is lemonade. Yeah. I mean, first of all, you have an artist like Beyonce who's able to, you know, be so captivating anyway on screen regardless. But I love where music videos have gone. I think there was a lull in the middle there for a while. Um, you know, there was a lot going on in the 80s. Certainly the 90s, I think, got really artistic. Then it started to just kind of die on the vine a bit. And there's now has been this great resurgence of music video and not just music video, but like music films. Um, yeah. I love this. And curious, first of all, your thought on the whole industry and your experience making Lemonade. Um, you know, it. I think that it's been really great that you there's been these, these films and, and then they really, are, that's what they really are. They're like these small films. And I can remember back in the late eighties and stuff with like Michael Jackson's thriller, where it was this like short film yeah. Um, yeah. that was happening with a lot of the artists. And then again, like you said, in the nineties, it just kind of died in the late nineties with, with the, those type of visuals. Yeah. And I think that Beyonce is such a, a avant-garde in a sense, as far as, you know, what she, what she does with her uh, music, what she does with, with her visuals, as well as her sister Salon, she's really killing it right now with her, with her new uh, videos and uh, album. And, you know, they're both very forward about that and a lot of what they're trying to say as well and being bold about that. So it was really a great experience. She is as brilliant as you might think or want to think she really is um she's such a hard worker and uh so kind that um she's just the most unique person uh you'll you'll meet really one of those people that you're like okay yeah i totally get it and talented Mm. completely and totally talented i know one night we were standing there and her playback didn't work so she was like "I'll, i'll just sing i don't even know if i'm supposed to be telling this story but She's like, I'll just sing, you know, it was late and we're all standing there. And she started singing a cappella and I, it just knocked everyone out. Oh my God. It was, and there was only like 50 people there. And, and, um, I mean, I, it was pretty, <laughs> it was one of those moments where you're like, I can't even believe this is happening in my life. <laughs> this is like, it's totally insane. It's like a private concert and she's just really a beautiful soul. So, you know, it, it was it was a it was a great experience and and uh, to be able to be a part of that and witness one of the I would say as far as like an entertainer she's one of the greatest entertainers right now so that was that was you know that'll go down for me I'll always remember that so that was awesome oh absolutely uh, and just curious your I mean your whole career is based on visuals and you're looking for visual references to make these uh, to make these beautiful images come on screen. But in a situation like this, where it's largely music driven, are you finding your inspiration from the music as well? You know, yeah, absolutely. You want to sort of dig into like what that, what, what the music is. And I mean, I love music. I love to dance. I can't hear any music without moving my body at some point in time. 
So it's, you know, what, how does that make you feel? Because it really is the highest art form. It really is the thing that can cause so many different emotions um, simply through the sound. And it's either very visceral, it can it make you feel so many different ways. So you want to really connect with that through what people are seeing as well. You want that to be not only relatable, but you want to also be able to tell a story um, through that. And it can be so many things. It can be fun. It can be um, dangerous. It can be, you know, existential. So you really want to uh, do as much with the music um, in conjunction with the visuals as, as possible. Mm. Well, your work is absolutely beautiful, and we'll put links to all sorts of stuff in the show notes so people can check it out if they haven't already. But um, really, Hannah, I can't thank you enough for being on the show. Like I said at the top, it's uh, production design is something that we very rarely talk about for no other reason, just that we seem to be getting a lot of director of photography on the show. But hopefully now with you on, um, we can sort of open the doors for other production designers to come on and talk about their experiences, because that's very, very important and really is the lifeblood of the film. It, it, you know, it is. It's, it, 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 all, it takes all of these crafts to make these things happen. And there's so many fantastic production designers out there who are my heroes and the people that I looked up to and still look up to. So it'd be great for you to do that. I mean, it's, it's, and, and you get a lot of funny stories too. So we get to see it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Hannah. Where can people go to find you online? Do you have a Facebook, Twitter? I do. I have a website, www.hannabeekler.com. And it has like articles in my portfolio and clips and things like that. So, Perfect. Or datnerdispoto.com. You can see my stuff there too. Absolutely. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. Hannah Beekler, thank you so much for being on. We'll have to have you back after uh, your next big film, Black Panther. How exciting. Yeah. Yeah. February, 2018. <laughs> oh my God. Well, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye, Ben. Huge thank you to Hannah Beekler for coming on the show and demystifying what a production designer actually does. It's so cool to talk to her and see just how early she gets involved in the films. Of course, you got to check out Moonlight. Everybody's talking about that film. It looks amazing. And um, the upcoming Black Panther. How cool is that? I want to thank Matt Russell from Gain Structure Sound for mixing, mastering, and making the show sound so good. You can find him at Gain Structure on Twitter and online, gainstructure.com. While you're on Twitter, you can tweet us at Go Creative Show. At Go Creative Show. Let us know what you think of the show. Let us know how we're doing. And of course, if you have guest suggestions, you can send them there. And I want to thank our sponsors. Hedge for Mac, Rule Boston Camera, Kessler Crane, New Shooter, Shutterstock, and Premium Beat. Without these people, the show wouldn't exist. So if you love the show then go and support those guys. Support those that support us. That's what it's all about. So much more coming from Go Creative Show. Keep it right here. See you next week. Bye-bye.